All right, come sit down. Gather around. Bring it in. Come on. Good morning, everyone. Um, so two reminders. Today at 2, it's gone. Today at 2, we are helping Miss Nipper move from the apartments to the apartment. So plural to singular. Um, anyone who helps gets one free disciplinary pass for next year. Yeah, no? OK, well, probably. Uh, she hasn't signed the contract I wrote up, wrote up, so I don't know if it's definite. But either way, uh, you should still come help. Um, I guess meet here at like 150, unless you know where she lives, and then meet over there at 2, because I don't know where she lives. So I'm going to figure that out between now and then. Um, another side note, Sunday night at midnight, no one's doing anything, so everyone's going to be behind the student center for the Stuco night party. Yeah, that's right. It's exciting. We're going to have hot dogs cooked by harvesters. Harvest ho harvester hot dogs is what I'm calling them. I just came up with that on the spot. It's very impressive. Harvester hot dogs. And games and glowy things and music. It's, gonna, it's the best thing in the world. So you should definitely be there. Thank you. Wow, is everybody sleeping today? Where's everybody at? What? Hey, uh, Sindra, welcome to last day of class, spring 2019, huh? Woo! Fantastic. Uh, well, we're really glad you're here. Uh, uh, before I turn this over to Ian, we're going to do something special for uh, those who are going to be going out and doing some mission work over the summer. Uh, but before I turn that out, I want to I wanna remind you all that we have... Uh, chapel next Tuesday, and then next Thursday is our Honors Chapel, and I know many of you are going to want to hit the road as soon as you can, but um, you've got some students that are, are going to be receiving their uh, just rewards uh, for the hard work they've put in over the last four years, so if you could stay and participate in that, uh, that would be awesome, okay? Yeah, like uh, Professor Ammon said, uh, we're going to do something a little special. Um, if you're going on a short-term mission, if you're going on long-term mission um, for the summer or for probably the rest of your life, uh, if you want to come down here to the front of the stage, as a school, we're going to pray for you. Um, if, if you're going on long-term missions or if you're going on short-term missions this year, if you would please come up here to the front of the stage. And we're going to have Dr. Curtis come up here and uh, Professor Ammon here. Is, we're going to pray over you and we're going to pray for you. Um, that includes you, Jason. I think you can take a break because you're, you're doing missions. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Curtis. Uh, we'll start it, and I'll have uh, Professor Ammon end it here. And if you want to, if you would please stand. Um, if you want to, you can lay hands on them, or uh, if you just want to reach your arms out, and we're just going to pray over them. There we go. We want that to happen. Um, if you would like to come up here and do that, put your hands on somebody, um, that's fine with me. <laughs> See how much easier that is? There we go. Good job. All right, let's pray together. What a privilege is ours to come before the very throne room of Almighty God. And so, God, our Father, through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, we come before you today to set this time aside to, to pray, to ask, to seek. We pray for these that have set their hearts in service to you in this special way as they prepare to, um, to serve, as they prepare to move out in ministry. We ask that you would watch over them, 
We ask that uh, you would continue to bless their efforts. And we know full well that it's not in their effort that things are accomplished in kingdom. But they have and they will continue to um, endeavor to serve you. To serve you in ways that uh, at times will be difficult. And so for that, we pray for your grace. To serve you in times when they will have conflict. For that, we pray that you would give them your peace. That the peace of Christ might dwell within them. And that they might be an example of what it is to know and to understand their walk with Jesus. And so that as they serve others, they will be an example of that walk. And they will be able to give an answer for the hope that lies within them. And so, Father God, we set them out in a way. We um, have deeply appreciated the opportunity that we have had to, um, to know them and to see their service, to see their hearts. And, oh, oh, Lord God, I'm so very, very thankful for the opportunity that I personally have had to, um, to know them. And we pray that as they move out and as they um, go to minister, that Lord God Jesus would be in their midst as is promised by the very power of the Holy Spirit, that they would receive guidance and direction, that they would know to turn to you. We rejoice. We rejoice in the example that they have set here on campus, and we rejoice in the way by which they will continue to minister. And in Christ's holy name. Father God, you are holy and awesome, and we want to make certain that in our sending out today that you are the center and the source for everything that is going on. I pray, Father, that you would increase the effectiveness of the gifts that you've built up in these people as they head out this summer. I pray, Father, that you would guard them from the influence of the evil one. I pray, Father, that as challenges come their way, they may rest in their clear assurance of your presence, both in their lives and in their ministries. I pray, Father, that you would help them break down cultural and social barriers between them and the people they're ministering to. And I pray, Father, that they may represent you in, through Christ in a way that uh, makes a, just a ton of difference in the areas where they go. Father, may you bless them through these efforts. Thank you so much for allowing us to be a part of your work in this world. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right. Hello. How are we doing this morning? Can you guys hear me? Good. Okay. There was a pause. I was worried for a second there. Are we awake? You can hear me. That's good. Loud and clear. All right. You can't hear me? <laughs> Hello. Okay, now you can hear me. That's cool. Awesome. Good morning. How are we doing? Woo! Yes. Praise. Yes. Are you ready? Yeah. All right. We're going to get things going this morning.
And then for this final song, we actually have a little like a uh, stomp clap that we're going to ask you all to do for us um, as a way to just participate. So it kind of goes like. Be sure. 
for this year. Thank you for all the great adventures that you allow us to have. Please help us in this next week so that we have good finals. Please help our speaker today to know what to say and to touch our hearts and to just speak on us and to call us to what we are supposed to be doing and to call us to more. I ask that you protect those who are going on missions and just protect us for the rest of the day and for the rest of the year and for all eternity. In, in your son's name, amen. Hey, guys and ladies, happy Friday. That's all I get. It's Friday. Yeah. I get the wonderful pleasure of introducing today's speaker. Um, some of you might have seen him around campus so far. Be easy on him. It's day three on the job. And what better to say, hey, you guys want to work together and put together a message for today? And he said, yes, absolutely. So I'm excited to introduce our new director of admissions, Mr. Brent Crosswhite. Um, and he has a really great message today to continue in the battle. And I'm really excited to hear it. And I know and I hope that you are as well. So Brent is, um, he's a jack of all trades. I'm really excited that he's here. So let me give you some little facts because I don't want to steal his thunder because I think he has some stories to tell. So 21 years he's been married to his wife, Sarah. Um, they, she will be joining him here soon. On average, they have moved every two years for 21 years. That's a marriage, right? That is awesome. Why? Because he's serving. Because their family serves. They are very dedicated to walking in the path. So Brent left the United States Army as a chaplain. He just retired, um, was stationed in Fort Bragg, North Carolina. Why not? Let's move to Moberly, Missouri. Um, <laughs> I kind of like the idea of North Carolina, but to each their own. Um, he was an ordained minister. Um, he has a broad ministry experience, working as a children's minister, a youth minister, and a senior minister in churches in Missouri and Oklahoma, and he hails from Oklahoma. Who is here from Oklahoma today? Anybody from Oklahoma? Where's Megan? Megan's from Oklahoma. We got <laughs> Oklahoma represented in here. Um, he spent two years as a house parent for Shiloh Christian's Children's Ranch, and the last 15 years serving in the military and bases both here in the U.S. and overseas um, for, and in deployments. As I said, Brent's been married for the last 21 years to his wife, Sarah. They have three children, Robert and David, who are in their 20s um, in college in Oklahoma, and Jennifer, who is attending high school. And I can't tell you, I can't wait to meet her because she could be a prospective student to come here. And of course, I'd just like to get to know her anyway. I think she's really excited to get those roots down as well. Um, Brent is a graduate of Ozark Christian College. He has a bachelor's of biblical literature and um, a master of religious education from Liberty University. So, Brent has jumped out of airplanes. He's jumped out of helicopters. He is, and if you meet him and get to see him, he's pretty calm and quiet, and he likes to listen, and he likes to develop relationships, but this guy is an adrenaline junkie. Um, he's done these types of things. I'm like, I don't know how I could have done that. He and his daughter um, are really passionate about motocross racing. 
um, which is awesome too. So just a couple of really neat things about him that I think as we get to know him, they plan to put their roots down and maybe make Moberly their home um, for forever. So um, please welcome Brent and uh, we'll look forward to hearing his message today. <laughs> thank you, thank you. So I'm the strange guy that you've been seeing around here um, in places that probably I had no idea existed. Um, Mobley, Missouri. Um, Friday last week, well, I have to get used to the light, it's bright. Um, Friday uh, of last week, I was in um, Fort Bragg, North Carolina. Wow, that's even better. Awesome. Phenomenal. Um, working as a chaplain for the United States Army, hanging out with um, um, my paratroopers who are also adrenaline, adrenaline junkies. They like to jump out of things that uh, go up in the air. In fact, I don't know how many times I've gone up with people that their first airplane ride was the airplane that they were going to jump out of. <laughs> that's insane, right? Um, I sat next to a young... A uh, 20-year-old private one day on an airplane, and I said, are you excited about the jump today? He goes, yeah, it's my first round, my first time after, he, after getting out of jump school. And the only times he'd ever been in an airplane was to jump out, so he'd never landed in one. <laughs> Insane, right? That's me. Um, and I'm excited about being here today. Uh, just a little bit um, about myself so that you can know who I am. Um, I am an Oki. We only have one other Oki in the crowd today, right? Right? Only one, only Oklahoman in the crowd today. Wow. Um, was everybody else from Missouri, Iowa, Kansas, Indiana? Wow. I, I'm a Sooner. I'm just going to say it right there. So I'll make everybody upset. I'm a Sooner. We had the number one uh, draft pick this year and last year. What can I say, right? Um, hopefully they turn out um, pretty good. Um, so I'm, I'm a small town guy, raised in Oklahoma. My, uh, my grandfather was a wheat farmer and a cattle, uh, cattleman, and um, I kind of grew up in this uh, world that was kind of in between country and city. Anybody else kind of feel that way before? You're not quite a country guy, but you're not quite a city guy either, right? Um, so I wear boots with things I shouldn't wear, right? I guess that's kind of kind of who I am. Um, I followed my best friend to Bible college because he was going to be a youth minister, and I was the one that stayed. <laughs> I was supposed to go do something else. I was going to be a teacher. Um, and uh, my, my buddy, he, he said, no, come to Bible college with me. So I did. And um, at the end of that year, he left uh, to become a fireman. And I was like, oh, I think I should stay. And uh, felt the call to, uh, in my life to, to give my uh, life to the Lord in service to uh, reaching others for, for Jesus Christ. And hopefully that's... Uh, touching some of you guys today that have been here. Maybe you're, maybe you're here that uh, you're thinking, man, I'm at the end of the year. I don't know what I'm going to do next year. Um, that was me. So I just stayed and uh, let God kind of mold and shape me um, through my Bible college years. I took my first job um, in the church after grading Bible, graduating from Bible college. Um, and, and like she said, I've done pretty much everything. So if you have a question about uh, ministry in a, that doesn't make sense to everybody else, come ask me. I'd love to sit down and talk to you. If you have uh, uh, questions about, I've been a children's minister, a youth minister, a pastor, uh, uh, a chaplain. Uh, I've, I've kind of done a little bit of everything. If you'd like to talk, I'd love to sit down and just uh, chat with you. If you want to talk about dirt bikes, I would love to sit down and chat to you about that. Um, so, um, I was in Oklahoma, Missouri mostly, um, serving as a pastor when, um, uh, the events of 9-11 happened, and that sent me, uh, on a path of following guys that were in my church, 
um, to war because they were going to war. They needed somebody to go to war with them, so I followed them. Um, it's as simple as that. That's why I did it. I loaded up my family, uh, started on a journey that began in South Carolina and ended last week in North Carolina. And let me tell you something. In North Carolina, I was living in the golf capital of the war world, right? I mean, like literally Pinehurst was, my, was five minutes from my house. If you're a golfer, that's, that's kind of like the U.S. Open uh, heaven area. Um, it's nice there. It's 80s there almost all the time until it gets hot for a little bit. Then it gets right back into that. It's, it's a wonderful place that's warm and inviting and not rainy and cold. <laughs> So getting here was a little bit, a little bit odd uh, for me. Um, you know, during the during my last kind of fifteen years, I've I've I had a lot of fun. Um, that's the kind of person I am. Um, I'm kind of quiet, unassuming, uh, until you uh, let me go do something that uh, spikes my heart rate. Um, and uh, sometimes that's been jumping out of aircraft. Sometimes it's been. Uh, uh, hanging out in the in the in the woods with soldiers, uh, sometimes just pulling a lanyard on an artillery piece, um, sometimes just hanging out in some third world country that um, I'd never been to before. Um, and some of the some of the places you have up on the on the wall, but I like to have fun for sure, right? Um, and so I get the opportunity to talk to you um, as you're getting ready to go into finals week. I've got two boys in college that just finished up finals week in, in uh, Oklahoma uh, in their college. And uh, hopefully they did good, um, good enough to go to school next year, I hope. Um, and I think that's probably what you guys are thinking. Uh, maybe as you're getting ready to get into this week, I've got to think about next week and passing classes well enough to... Uh, I guess come back next year, right? Or maybe go in the summer or, I don't know, they don't have summer school here, do they? Um, maybe some of you guys are going to that. But they asked me to come talk to you today in the series of, um, that they're going through called Battle Ready, I think, because that's, that's a series, right? And they gave me the topic of the sword of the spirit. So if you could open your Bibles, uh, if you got them here. Or if you're like me and you sit in church uh, with this and the preacher thinks uh, that you're not really paying attention, but you are because you got your Bible right here, right, um, with your commentary um, and whatever notifications that you're getting at the same time, well, open that up. I'm, I'm cool with that. Um, to Ephesians chapter 6, um, I get the opportunity to talk to you about the weapon that is the sword of the Spirit. Pretty cool. Read with me, if you would, um, Ephesians chapter 6. I, you probably have gone over this a bit, but we're going to go over it a little bit this morning just to get started. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God so that you will, not, so that you will be able to stand firm against the, the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood but against the rulers, against the powers, against the, uh, the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the full armor of God so that just you will be able to resist in the evil day and having done everything to stand firm, stand firm therefore, and then it says put on these pieces, Right? And then in verse 7, it says, after putting on all these pieces, take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Take up, I guess you would probably you could add that little up in there. Take up, after you've put on the armor of God, these two pieces. Soldiers have been my life. Um, I was an enlisted soldier at one point in, in, uh, in my life. Uh, not only did I, I guess, pursue ministry as, a, uh, as a, a pastor and a youth minister, but I also decided uh, when 9-11 happened to enlist in the Army, so I became a regular soldier. I carried a weapon. Um, I learned to use that weapon, and uh, 
to defend my country, um, to take up arms uh, in defense of my country, um, and to follow basically where uh, I was commanded to go. And then after that, I served uh, soldiers, their family members, in multiple different countries uh, around the world, I, I, you know, Iraq, uh, Germany, um, all over Africa, Korea, Japan, um, the Philippines, following my soldiers and, and what they did uh, and how they served. But anyway, I learned soldiers, and I learned about armor in a way that maybe you um, that haven't been in type of that type of environment uh, wouldn't know. You see, when, when a soldier puts or gets ready for battle, the, the, one of the first things obviously they do is they put their clothes on, they put their boots on, they put their belt on. Believe it or not, you, you, you can get in trouble in the military for not having your belt on. You got to have it on. Even though you can't see it underneath the battle dress, you have to have your belt on. It's for a lot of reasons, so that we can drag you if, um, from the battlefield. If you uh, are injured, we can grab a hold of that belt, and it, it, it helps you uh, easier for carry. Um, but they put all these things on, and we would go to battle uh, with our boots, our, our armor, our, our uh, chest armor, our shoulder armor, our, our, um, our helmets, all those type of things. Um, and those are the type of things that they just kind of naturally always have on. The last thing that they, they ever do, the last thing you'll ever see a soldier do, if you see him out in the field or getting ready for battle or getting ready to get into a tank or getting ready to, to, to work an artillery piece or getting ready to, to jump into a helicopter or an airplane to jump out, the last thing that you will ever see them do is pick up their helmet and strap it on and then pick up their weapon. That's the last two things that they'll do. And that's because those are the pieces that are the final preparation for war. You see, the weapon that a soldier has is a life-taking instrument. Make no mistake that when a soldier or a warrior trains for battle and trains to use their weapon, they're not training to use the weapon as a defensive item. They've got their armor for that. They're training to use that weapon to take lives. And they're serious about it. And when Scripture talks about the word as a sword... It's pretty serious about it. In Isaiah chapter 49, um, the word is described as a sharp sword. My mouth is a sharp sword. And in Hosea chapter 6, it says, Therefore I have hewn them to pieces. I've cut them to pieces by the prophets. I've slain them by the words of my mouth. The word that we have to use as a battle item is a life taker. In Revelation chapter 1, it says that um, in his right hands he held seven stars, and out of his mouth, out of the, the, the words that he speak, became a sharp two-edged sword. In Revelation chapter 2, it says, Therefore, repent, I am coming to you quickly, and I will make war against you with the sword of my mouth. A sharp weapon to strike down the enemy is the word of God. And I want to talk to you just, just briefly on, on, uh, about that, that word. You see, we are given as Christians all sorts of armor to, to protect us from the enemy's advances. You know, righteousness, um, uh, the, the girding ourselves with the loins of truth, the breastplate of license, shod in your feet with the gospel of peace, 
We have the helmet of salvation, those things to protect us. But we have one thing to fight a battle with, and that is the sword. And when we're talking about a warrior's weapon, we're talking about something that is used to not just be kind of placed in a sheath, but something to, to take lives with. Let me explain that. You're getting ready to leave next week uh, from here, which is really exciting and really scary at the same time, right? Some of you guys are leaving to new jobs. Some of you guys are leaving to new schools. Some of you guys are, are leaving to new ways of life. Some of you guys are leaving to go home to old things that you never, um, ex- never wanted to even think about and, and this place, the school, I remember Bible college is kind of like a fortress, right? This is kind of like a fortress of, of goodness that you get to be um, a part of, right? You get to be um, protected in. But you're getting ready to leave next week out of the fortress to face the enemy without the protection of the walls of the school. When I was in Iraq, guys would, would come over to me, soldiers would come to me, and they would, they would ask me to, to pray in some very weird ways. I've been asked to walk up to a M1 Abrams, put my hand on it, and pray for that tank itself to be able to protect, to, 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 to not get hit. That sounds crazy, but that's what happened. I've been asked to go up to, to gun trucks and place my hand on the weapon uh, just to, to say, guys would say, could you just put your hand on my, on my weapon, chaplain, so that it doesn't misfire, that it fires true? That sounds crazy to you, I'm sure. But I've been asked to pray in some crazy, crazy way. Guys would have me pray over their vehicles. I was asked to, to place my hand on their, on their uniforms, their, their gear, their weapons. Because when we would get ready to leave the wire in Iraq or, or in some other places that I've been, it was scary. And soldiers and myself, as I was going with them, as we were in our combat vehicles, were, were thinking as we left the fortresses, the, we would call them forward operating bases, as we would leave those places, we knew that the enemy and was basically everybody outside of that wire, outside of that fortress, and they were there to literally take our lives. We, we went through a, a corridor, I remember, that the soldiers called... They, they called it the Hershey Bypass. Now, you can think about for just a second why they called it that. It was that bad that when you went through it, man, it was pretty tight. It was in the face of the enemy that I learned to use the weapon that God gave me, my sword, for real. I prayed. I quoted scripture. I trusted in God with all my heart, leaning not on my own understanding, expecting Him to lay my path straight. I prayed in ways that I only thought of, I could, I could visually think of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego as, as they prayed, you know, we're going into the fire, but if God doesn't save us, that's okay. And it was those prayers and the words and the scriptures I would share with my soldiers before they stepped out of the, out of the, the compounds, before they walked out, before they rode out of the, of the fortresses that, that we have and the, and the bases that we have for them, it was those scripture readings that helped me to bear witness to soldiers that had never known Jesus Christ before, and they saw my faith in the scripture, and in my weapon, and even though that I was scared, they had faith through watching me wield the sword. Christ used the word, as we know, against the enemy. In Matthew chapter 4, he keeps saying over and over and over to the enemy, you know, it's written, it's written, 
it's written. He used the weapon effectively to combat his enemy. And that is what we are called to do and to know. Charles Spurgeon once said, Never let it be suspected by you that God has recorded truth in His Word which you have never once read. you got to know how to use your weapon if you're going to be able to wield it correctly. Some of the biggest victories that I've ever seen have ever been witnessed to have been due to the weapon that God gave me wielded to create new life in an old soldier. For two years, I'm going to share this. I got to serve as a basic training chaplain at Fort Sill, Oklahoma. It was one of the funnest things I ever got to do. I, I've jumped out of airplanes. I've jumped out of helicopters. I've rappelled down walls. I've been in uh, enemy firefights. I've gotten to climb mountains in, in foreign countries. But one of the most funnest, the funnest two years I had probably in my military career was working with basic trainee soldiers as they trained to become artillery and air defensemen. <clears throat> when a soldier goes through basic training, let me, let, me, let me talk to you just about modern basic training. When a soldier goes through basic training, one of the very first persons that they meet, other than their drill sergeant, who has already shaved their heads, put them in new uniforms, and scared them almost to death, is the chaplain. After they get the shock of the drill sergeant, the soldiers are all huddled into a room. Believe it or not, not much different than what you guys are right here. They're scared, they're bald, and they stink. And I step into a room just about like this, and I'm the only person that's not scowling at them. <clears throat> and it was during that time I introduced them to what a chaplain is. And I literally gave out, during those two years, thousands and thousands of Bibles. You see, in a year, I would touch the lives of just over 5,000 soldiers. Just in one year. And I would get to hand every one of them a Bible. Because they basically had two options for reading while they were in, in those nine weeks of, of uh, glorious time that they get to spend in basic training. They could read their field manual or they could read something religious. And since I was their chaplain, guess what the religious thing I made sure that they had? it, The Word of God. And that sword, that weapon that I wielded in basic training, cut just as the Scripture said it did. For the Word of God is living and active, Scripture says, and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and able to judge the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. That's our weapon. And every week for nine weeks, while the soldiers were there, something happened that would blow my mind. You see, I would give the soldiers a Bible, and then I generally wouldn't see them but maybe once a week for maybe 10 minutes as I was passing by. But those soldiers had nothing else to read but the Scriptures. And they would come to me at the end of each week, in groups of 10, sometimes 20, sometimes more than that. And they would say, Chaplain, we didn't know anything about this thing you gave us, but we had nothing else to read, so we read it. And something has happened to us. We believe. Will you baptize us? And so every Sunday... We'd have a tank of water, and we would baptize so many soldiers that that water would turn literally brown, washing the old away, and seeing the new come to life. 
Some of these people, for the first time ever, read about Jesus just by touching this weapon that we are given. Every week, the sword of the Spirit would kill the old and bring life to the new. I'm here to tell you, as you're getting ready to go out this week, that's coming ahead, you're getting ready to leave college, it's going to be scary, but you have a life taker. As my, sar- my soldiers would say, you have a life taker, a heartbreaker, right? They'd say, I'm a life taker, chaplain, I'm a heartbreaker. You have a life taker, a heartbreaker, and a soul claimer. The fruits of the Spirit are love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, and against those things, nothing else can stand but the sword of the Spirit is an instrument that God has given you to take the battle to the enemy. So don't be afraid of it. As you're leaving this week, as you get ready to start your finals, as you're getting ready to go to those new jobs, take your weapon, pick it up, and take the fight to the enemy. Amen? Amen.